I want to read to you a list of all the stores that are closing uh, <clears throat> this year, 2017. 2017, there is thousands and thousands of stores closing. There's hundreds of thousands of stores closing. Tavana is closing 379 stores. I'm not even sure what Tavana is. Um, it says, bad news for tea lovers. Starbucks is closing every single one of its Tavana retail stores after a strategic review of its business. Sears and Kmart's closing 43 additional stores. J.C. Penney is closing 138 stores. Macy's is closing 68 stores. Jamboree is closing 350 stores. True Religion is closing 27 stores. <clears throat> Michael Kors is closing 100 to 125 stores. Payless Shoe Source is closing 512 stores and counting. BB Stores is closing 180 stores. Rue 21 is closing 400 stores. Radio Shack is closing 1,000 stores. Abercrombie & Fitch is closing 60 stores. Guess is closing 60 stores. Crocs is closing 160 stores. The Limited is closing 250 stores. Wet Seal is closing 171 stores. American Peril is closing 110 stores. BCBG is closing 120 stores. Grander Mountain is closing, oh, they're not determined yet, about 126 stores, what they're looking at in their liquidation process. H.H. H. Uh, Gregg is closing 220 stores. GameStop is closing 150 plus stores. Staples is closing 70 stores. CVS is closing 70 stores. Family Christian is closing 240 stores. Clark's uh, Takeaway is, uh, I think they're completely closing. Uh, so that's just a small list of the stores closing in 2017. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get much worse. I told you about the restaurants that are closing in 2017. It's closing. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, not as you're hearing in your government, as you're hearing in the politicians, or, or as you're hearing on the news today. Um, the economy is really doing really horribly. It's not doing very well, people. In fact, I would say, I, I, I would say, the economy right now in the United States is on life support. I, I dare to say that. I, I believe that the economy in the United States of America is on life support right now as we speak. Um, you don't hear in the mainstream media about the people that once had jobs and had nice houses and that are living on the streets right now are living in their cars. You won't hear that on the mainstream news. Remember, the mainstream news is always geared to uh, program the people to believe what they want them to believe, right? What the, um, you know, one percenters want the people to believe. Because if the people believe everything's fine, then, you know, then you can keep more rest. You know, it's not unrest. I mean, it's hard to control people that are not in rest. So they're even looking at ways where they can cause people to even be more at rest. And Donald Trump's coming along saying he's going to um, cut taxes and, and cut back on taxes and and all this. And it's supposed to, like, you know, lull the – or call, I should say, uh, call the sheep. It's, it's, it, it, it's the calling. It's sad, but it's true, people. Maybe you don't understand it, but the United States of America and other nations around the world are being herded right now to the slaughter. Are you listening? Led as sheep to the slaughter. That's what's happening 
nationwide and even worldwide right now. And uh, you don't have to be one of them that's being uh, driven to the market, that's being driven to the, uh, to the slaughterhouse. Uh, how can you escape that? Well, uh, back in Jeremiah's day, he said God's people were like sheep led to the slaughter. And so Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Holy Ghost in the New Testament, said, We are led as sheep to the slaughter. Paul said, Nay, we are not as sheep led to the slaughter. We are, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now, you can be more than a conqueror. What could be more than a conqueror? Well, a conqueror is someone that has victory, right? Well, more than a conqueror it means you get to enjoy the spoils of that victory. And most of God's people today don't even enjoy their salvation, never mind the spoils of salvation. But I will tell you that there is, without question, a change taking place. As I told you in the previous message, there is a change taking place in the economy, just like the voice told my pastor. Um, you're going to see more stores shutter. You're going to see more uh, restaurants shutter. You're going to see con continually, even though, even though the politicians will tell you different, you're going to see it. Stores closing. Why? Why are stores closing down? Why is even McDonald's closing stores? Why? Something's not good, people. And they know it. And they're preparing for it. The only reason why major store chains would be closing stores is because they, they know something's on the horizon. They know something you and I may not know. And they're preparing for the storm. They're preparing for what's coming. They feel it. They sense it. Someone that's uh, got a sense for business knows when to get in and knows when to get out. And I think a lot of these major corporations, a lot of these companies right now are pulling out and they're trying to gather together their resources and gather together their uh, wealth so that they can make it through the storm that's coming. And I believe they know something we don't as far as, uh, you know, as far as this new world order that's coming in. Remember, all money, all wealth, is going to be replaced with the mark of the beast eventually. Are you listening? You will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Now, I will say something I never thought about before. I will say this. Nowhere in the scripture does the Bible say that just because there's going to be a mark issued, that regular monetary money is going to go away. It doesn't say the mark of the beast is going to replace. Did you hear what I just said? It doesn't say in the scripture that the mark of the beast will replace the money. Or it's going to replace um, our currency. It doesn't say that. It just says you won't be able to buy or sell without that mark. Is anybody out there listening? That's something fresh. That's something new. Because I never thought about that before. So I've been thinking that way. I've been thinking that the mark of the beast is going to replace the economy. It's going to replace the uh, currency, the global the currency. But that's not what the scripture says, does it? The scripture says you will not be able to buy or sell without that mark. Are you listening, people? So that doesn't mean gold is going to go away. Doesn't mean silver is going to go away. Doesn't mean precious stones is going to go away. Doesn't mean that regular money is going to go away. Regular cash even. But it does mean is that you will have to join their club. You will have to join. Uh, so, something is coming that you'll have to join something. Because you look up the word mark in the book of Revelation. And it has to do with the mark of servitude. And obviously it has to do with worshiping the beast as well. So, um, but it does say that they're going to remove the gold. The gold will be removed 
and it says that the people are going to throw their silver in the streets. So, I don't know what's going to replace the uh, currency, the current currency. I don't know if it's going to be some kind of a Bitcoin or some kind of a, um, you know, uh, digital kind of form of money. Uh, but I've never looked at that before, that it doesn't have to replace the currency, the mark of the beast. It could play right alongside the currency. I never saw that before, people. See, the Lord said he would open to us the scriptures. Amen. He would give us understanding. And that's the most wonderful. I think that's the most wonderful thing. If you're a listener on this broadcast is as I'm receiving from the Lord, you're receiving at the same time. Because many times people, because I'm just an oracle, many times when I'm speaking, it's coming right there, right now, live. Amen. Right from the throne. It's not something that God showed me previous to. You're getting it when I'm getting it. It's like we're, t we're tuned into a, a station, right? It's like we're tuned in and we're receiving it live. And we are. We're receiving it right directly from the throne of Almighty God. Praise the Lord. As a branch in the vine, amen, supplying what needs to be supplied. Hallelujah. Praise God. The golden oil, the oil's flowing, people. And you don't have to be one of those foolish virgins. You don't have to be one of those wise virgins in this hour that got oil for their lamp but fell asleep. Amen. You can fill up your vessel right now as you're listening to this broadcast. Get all the oil you can get. Amen. Fill your vessel right now. Get filled up. You need the oil if you're going to burn, if you're going to be a light in this hour. But remember, just because you have oil, just because you have truth to light that lamp, just because you might be burning, and, and that doesn't mean that you're awake. They fell asleep, and their lamps went out while they were sleeping. It wasn't till the midnight hour that they awoke and trimmed their lamps, people. You need to understand how serious this is. Jesus said, watch and pray. He didn't say, go to sleep. Amen. Just because you got oil, just because you've got truth to light that lamp, amen, just because you've got that robe of white, amen, to be like a torch as it were. No, just because you have all those things in place doesn't mean that you can go to sleep. You got to stay awake. You got to stay on your post. Amen. Hallelujah. In a time of war, if you fell asleep when you were supposed to be watching, you'd be executed. Because the way they looked at it during the time of war is if you fell asleep, you didn't care about those men. Yeah, you would receive the same. That's That was the, the punishment, that was the penalty of falling asleep in the time of war when you were supposed to be watching. Can you imagine? That must have got some soldiers' attention when they saw a soldier being executed because he fell asleep. I, I guarantee the next soldier didn't fall asleep very easily. Thank God that Jesus Christ doesn't handle things that way. Thank God that Jesus, yeah, he might let you go to sleep and you may not wake up until the middle of the great tribulation. You may not wake up it, in, until uh, after you've been greatly persecuted. But at least you're not going to die and go to hell. People listen to me. Jesus has done everything he can possibly do to make you and I to be successful. Everything. Everything. I asked the Lord one day, I said, Lord, why is everything seem so rigorous? Why does, is the training so hard? You know what he said to me? He said, I'm not leaving anything to chance. That's what Jesus said to me. I'm not leaving anything to chance. And that's who he is. Jesus doesn't do things roughshod. Amen? Jesus doesn't just do things half-hearted, nothing to chance. There won't be any slip-ups. There will be no mistakes. It's going to be to perfection, people. The Lord does everything to perfection. Hallelujah. There won't be any loopholes. There will be no gaps. There will be no inroads. No. 
He does all things well and perfect. Amen. He's the captain. He is the captain of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. I'm, I hate, really, that most of God's people, when they listen to me, they think that the gospel is a fairy tale. I try to help you understand this is real. This is real, people. Satan wants you to believe this isn't going to happen. It's not coming. It is coming. Everything that you read in the Bible is going to happen, people. Just as it says. The Bible is the inspired record. Did you hear what I said? It's an inspired record. Just as it happened back then, it was written. It's, an, it's a record that was inspired by the Holy Ghost. Holy men were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen? When the scriptures were penned. Hallelujah. And then God raised up King James, praise the Lord, to give to you and I a Bible so that we'd have a Bible, something that we could use as a road map, something we could use as a, as a treasure map, something we could use, amen, to make it safely all the way home, praise the Lord, so we could understand truth. But not depend on just the scripture like there's nothing else, no. The Lord opens those scriptures to us, gives us understanding, gives us revelation of those scriptures. If all you have is the scriptures, that's wonderful, but there's more. Let Jesus open up the scriptures to you. Amen? Let him give you insight. Let him give you the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and, and revelation. Hallelujah. And, and help you to open up the scriptures and see and understand the truth. The truth doesn't have to, the scriptures don't have to be in a cryptic or a, uh, they don't have to be in de de deciphered. Like the worlds, they, like the Kabbalah and the Zohar, and the, you know, they're trying to say the scriptures have to be decoded. No, they don't. They have to be revealed by the Holy Ghost, and things are sealed up, amen, to the time of the end, but the Holy Ghost is blowing the lid off, taking the lid off. You need to understand, people, that the book of Revelation cannot be fulfilled, it cannot happen until the seals are removed. Each of those seals is holding a part of God's revelation of his, of his judgments and his wrath. That is the very thing that's holding back the wrath and the, ju or the judgment and the wrath of God is those seals. And you put a seal to, to seal something up, right? Well, those seals have to be released. And the only one that can release those seals is Jesus. Are you listening? That book, that little book, the book of Revelation, that little book in the hand of our Heavenly Father that's going to be put in the hand of Jesus, Jesus is the only one that can open that book. He's the only one that can read that book. He's the only, and as he reads it in heaven, it will come to pass on the earth, people. As Jesus speaks it, remember in the, uh, in the scripture when Jesus opened the book and he says, in fact, sometimes I think that the little book we read about in the book of Revelation may not even be the book of Revelation. It actually may be the, the, uh, the word of God itself as far as the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, because when Jesus read, the, uh, read Isaiah, he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing. And he didn't read the rest of the scripture. If you look at the scripture, it says, and the vengeance, and the day of the vengeance of our God. And so... Jesus didn't read that part. He read the first part of that, and then he closed the book. Well, could it be that that little book that he has in his hand in the book of Revelation is him opening that scroll again to finish reading that verse? How many ministers take it that serious when they read the Bible? How ministers take that serious when they read scriptures? Jesus read the scripture, and he said it was fulfilled when he read it. He didn't read the part about wrath. He didn't read the part about judgment. But he will. It's coming. He's the only one that's worthy to open the book. He's the only one that's worthy to read 
what is in that book. He paid the price. He's the only one that can do it. I would like to be with Jesus on his side when he reads that part of the book of Isaiah. The vengeance of God. The day of vengeance. I don't want to be on the earth when he's reading that. Do you? When Jesus says it's being fulfilled right now. Being fulfilled, the word of God. It's going to happen just like it says. Oh yes, people. How many of you out there are really growing? How many of you really developing? How many of you are really growing in the Lord? Growing in the knowledge of of the Lord and growing in the knowledge of truth. How many? I think a lot of you play games. Really. I think a lot of you out there, you don't take it serious. You don't take this serious. You play church. You play with it. You play with the Lord. You think you're playing with the Lord. You're not playing because he's not playing. You may think you're playing, but the day will come when the Lord will Read the rest of that scripture. It won't just be the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. No. Go a little further. Read the rest of it. Jesus read the part that he was fulfilling. He had been anointed to go about doing good and healing all that was sick and oppressed of the devil. He was anointed. Amen. He did that part. But he had closed the book. And all those that looked upon him... They said his words were gracious. Well, when he reads the book, in the book of Revelation, it's no longer gracious words. It's vengeance. It's the vengeance of God. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Don't you just love Jesus? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. So few, Lord, in this hour have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. So few, Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe we're living in a time, brothers and sisters, when the Lord is going to have Brother Joseph speak words as it's going to take place. Oh, yeah. The time will come where God will say, Maybe an earthquake or something will happen in a city or somewhere. And as I'm actually speaking the words, you'll hear it in the news that it happened. You don't think that's true? Just before the earthquake took place in Virginia and, and struck the, the Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty at the same time, I was praying in the Spirit and asked God, to bring down, I, I, this is how I prayed. I said, God, I said, the men of this country, the men, men of, this, of the United States, the people, they look at these monuments and they get strength from them. I said, Lord, tear those down. Tear them down so that they don't feel like they're so, you know, have so much confidence and they don't feel so arrogant that they, you know, because they use those things to prop themselves up. God in his mercy didn't, tear them down but he certainly did hit them gave a warning he even let me know he heard my prayer amen God's not playing games people when I was just a young minister not even a minister really I just had just got started in Bible school went uptown in uh, Portland Maine went for a walk and uh, went into this store, an oriental store. I wasn't even a man of God. I wasn't even a, just still a babe, really. And uh, went into the store and just to share Jesus. I was, the guy was so rude to me. He even put the clothes sign on the door when he was kicking, us, kicking me out. And, uh, but I noticed he had this huge Buddha. And I've never seen, I mean, this thing, this sculpture was so huge. And I thought, wow, that thing probably has a stronghold over the city to some degree, or at least this, at least this uh, region or this area of the city. And so as I was walking out in the Holy Ghost now, this is not something I pre-thought or, you know, premeditated, no. 
As I was walking out in the spirit, I laid my hand on the counter at the grocery counter. I said, if I be a child of God, because I didn't have the confidence to say a man of God at the time. I said, if I be a child of God, fire will come down and consume this place. Three days later, or actually the next day, I was going up the street. The same man that put the clothes sign on the door. He comes running out of his store when he sees me and he says, come, have tea. He wanted to invite me in for tea. He says, me, my wife, we have bad dream last night. Bad dream. See, God was warning him. And at that stage, I didn't have the wisdom, the knowledge, the training, the understanding that when God gave him that dream that I was supposed to have the interpretation to that dream. I didn't have that maturity like I do now. If someone was to tell me they had a dream, I'd go and get the answer from God like Daniel did and like others, Joseph, you know. But, <clears throat> you know, I didn't have the interpretation of his dream. I didn't know I was supposed to have the interpretation of his dream at that point. I was just a baby in Christ. And so I didn't say anything. I walked away. Three days later, folks, God be my witness, three days later, the place was burned to the ground. And what was interesting is there was two buildings on either side of it and never neither one of them was touched by the fire. Just that building in the center of two other buildings on a you know downtown city in a very populated area only that building burned to the ground. And I went back several years later and it's still empty that lot in between the two buildings. Nothing was rebuilt there. Just a reminder, just like God's word says, when he judges with fire, nothing will ever be burnt, built there again. You wonder why Babylon hasn't been rebuilt? Why it hasn't been revived? Because God judged it. They can't build there. They will never build there. Nothing will ever be built there again, people. You need to listen to me. It's desolate. It becomes desolate when God judges it. So, that's why there'll have to be a new heaven and a new earth, because God's going to judge this earth. It won't be building on the same earth. No, it says a new heaven and a new earth. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah was never rebuilt. God judged it with fire. It's become desolate. So, we are living in the last of the last days, down to the last, down to the wire here. We are down, my pastor was saying that years ago we're down to the wire. So where are we now, people? If we were down to the wire years ago, where are we now? This is not about preach it, brother, or hand pats. No, this is about becoming sober. That's the message of the gospel. If a true man of God is ministering the word of God, if it's a true minister, God says, if it's my prophet, if it's my minister, he will turn the people back to me. Amen? And that's what it's about. It's about repentance. It's about getting the people to turn back to God. Hallelujah. So in the days ahead, you very may well hear Brother Joseph pronounce judgment on a certain area and then hear in the news that it happened because that's the hour we're living in. God is not playing games, people. I remember my pastor pre uh, preaching in the tent. As he preached the message from the Old Testament scriptures about Samson and the uh, brands being tied around the fox's tails, the message, the title of the message was When God Burns Your Barley Fields. While he was preaching, they came to the tent and reported to a woman in the tent, Your house is on fire. You think God's playing games, people? When God burns your barley fields. See, when a real man of God preaches, that's not to be taken lightly when it's a real preacher of the gospel. When it's a real 
man of God. And it's not that we set our set apart and we say, oh, I'm a prophet and you're not. No. Moses said, would to God all God's people would prophesy. No, the scripture says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So if you're a testimony, if you have a real testimony, if you're a, if you testifying for Jesus, it's not your words. It's not your thoughts. Amen? It's the Holy Ghost. And that's what makes the difference. I'm amazed how many times I share things on this broadcast and it comes out in the news the next day. I'm amazed. It's happening cl more and more every time now. Things I just got done saying. Just recently I was saying something. I can't remember what it was just a few days ago. Before I said it, it was in the news. The next, like the next, uh, it may even been at the same, right in the same amount of time. While they were printing it or while they were putting it up on the internet, I was preaching it. I want to get to the place where we're at least one step ahead. Four steps ahead, five steps ahead. Amen. Be able to give some uh, pre-warning. Uh, to be able to prophesy before it happens. We don't want to talk about it after it happens. That will be no good for anybody. But we want to warn people before it happens. So you better stay tuned to this broadcast, people, unless you know someone else that's uh, connected to the vine, the true vine, unless you know somebody else that knows God's voice. Stay close. God bless you.